Um, I also think that's actually probably a pretty good description of why a lot of really bad IF writing is really bad, is that people imagine it uh, the, as being what they later discovered 3D graphics simulations actually were. They imagine it as being just a way of recreating the world around them in computer form. Here's my IF desk, and here are my IF papers, and my IF cup, and I'll drink out of it. Um, but that's not what makes IF work and what makes IF writing interesting. And, and by and large, today, when we see IF writers talking about IF, um, this is an amazing time for IF writing because we know that's not what IF is because immersive 3D computer graphics do that much better. Uh, IF doesn't have to be the perfect recreation of the obvious participatory universe. It did that very poorly anyway, and now that's not its job. Somebody else can do that job, and IF can do what it does really well, which is uh, uh, discovery and surprise and uh, epiphany. Hmm. I thought his PhD was computer science, but I, I, I'd have to go back and check. But I mean, of course, uh, Marianne Buckle's uh, doctrine in German literature, right? Uh, that's the funny thing about um, disciplinary studies, is that your work is supposedly owned by whatever your discipline you're in. And uh, no discipline has been extremely excited about owning text adventure games. <laughs> They've uh, found academic safe harbor in whatever individual was most passionate about them. I think uh, my, my doctorate is uh, officially in English literature. My field is new media. Uh, so, you know, in, in, when I came to, you know, in, in, when I came to, when I went to graduate school, actually, this is, this might be an interesting story. Uh, I graduated from college in 1999, and uh, leaving California and moving to the East Coast, I quickly found myself uh, telecommuting 3,000 miles or so via webcam to work for a dot-com that had started up in Pasadena. Uh, so I was uh, working for a dot-com, uh, thinking about digital culture and, and uh, why it was important to me, uh, and what I wanted to do next, because I didn't want to be working for a dot-com forever. As it turns out, um, even the people who did, generally speaking, didn't get that choice, but I chose to leave before, um, <clears throat> before uh, getting stuck with the check. Um, so I was thinking about it, and I'd become really interested in hypertext fiction. I was webmastering, I was writing a lot of hypertext. I had studied English literature. I was really passionate about art and writing. And I ended up applying to graduate programs that had uh, that um, supported study of hypertext fiction, which is um, uh, much more respectable in English literature departments, I think, than interactive fiction is. Because you don't, they're, they're objects that aren't called games, uh, hypertext fiction has never had a crass commercial period. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's not a low, it's never been associated with low culture. Um, but so I came to, I came to graduate school without a thought in my head about interactive fiction, actually. And I started studying a lot of kinds of new media, one of which was, um, hypertext fiction, but many more. And I was just interested in, um, uh, digital literature, anything made out of letters that was on a computer. It could be an animated poem. Uh, it could be something you could click on. It could be something you could type into. Um, and then, as uh, many people have, I rediscovered interactive fiction through uh, the online communities uh, that had been around for quite a while and um, their organization around um, the Usenet groups 
it's etc 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 websites everything was tied in and as soon as you find the outer edge of the web everything funnels in towards the center and you find this interconnected group of people um who are really passionate and excited um at that moment my thought was uh well i want to study this because this could be a real contribution I felt like a lot of people didn't know about it yet. I wasn't aware of Nick Montfort's work at the time. Um, and of course, when I first heard about his book, my first thought was, uh, well, I'm doomed. Uh, now, if somebody else has already done this, there's, I will have nothing interesting to say. I think this happens to graduate students a lot. But, uh, but the point of the story is that uh, I went to graduate school planning on studying digital literature some kind of text on a computer that did something interesting that it doesn't do off a computer. And even though, as a child, I'd played interactive fiction, um, I had no concept or thought of interactive fiction as digital literature. I didn't make that connection in my own mind. I had to find people who were talking about it and then say, oh, and I know... I know for a lot of people, um, interactive fiction is a very nostalgic, uh, experience in some ways that it's, people are interested in the future of interactive fiction, but there are also a lot of people who are very heavily invested in it because it's part of their own past. And, um, I recognize and draw on the stories from my childhood of experiencing interactive fiction, but that's never been my emotional relationship to it. I really, um, I really feel like I encountered interactive fiction in some ways for the first time in graduate school. Uh, my old memories were, um, had to all be re-experienced. I had to read everything over again and say, well, that wasn't, that wasn't the same work that I read the first time. Um, I realized in a lot of ways that some, that a lot of commercial interactive fiction had been too mature for me to understand it that uh, A Mind Forever Voyaging and Trinity, um, I read them as a child believing that I was playing a game that had been purchased for me that was fun and not even occurring to me what I was missing. Um, and I was... Uh, and so for me, first I thought, well, if, if I missed this with my direct experiences, how many other people uh, can't look past the cover of what these things are to what they say? Uh, and another thing, when I encountered the idea of the topic of studying interactive fiction academically, I became very excited about the future of interactive fiction. I think a lot of people in the late 1980s and early 1990s believed that somehow there would be a kind of a graphics card migration of all of what made interactive fiction great into things that would eventually cleanly evolve into something like what we see today in, say, World of Warcraft. Um, and when that didn't happen, when it was, uh, when there's this rupture and discontinuity and totally new genres arose in relation to graphics and there was a commercial crash, um, people felt like, um, the rich promise of interactive fiction had been tested in the marketplace and had failed. Um, and I didn't see that at all. Um, to me, what I see is not that, um, that the Infocom canon needs to be redeemed even, or that we need to be, uh, um, more historically appreciative. But what I saw was that people were just now experiencing this renaissance of saying, wait, we have this interactive writing art form that we are just fully beginning to understand what it does and how it works. This is um, a kind of a, a high point for, for uh, rhetoric, craft, um, uh, uh, as, as I know a few other people have said, Jimmy Maher is one of them, uh, this could be a sort of golden era. Um, and I was like, all right, I'll write about it. <laughs> so, so yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. 
Um, well, uh, my dissertation is on text adventures. It's, um, I call, I, I call it interactive fiction. Um, and I think, uh, and with actually, okay. My, my dissertation is on interactive fiction and, uh, because there are many things that are, uh, text adventures, you could say it's a subset of interactive fiction, or you could say interactive fiction is sort of the pretentious literary wing of text adventures. Um, uh, I talk about, uh, cavern crawls a lot, but I don't really study them, uh, as much. I tend to go for the high concept early stuff and a lot of the contemporary stuff, which tends to look more like short fiction and novellas, character-based drama, things like that. Um, so that's my topic. Um, but you know, looking at my dissertation, looking at my dissertation, uh, it's partly about the history of literature and it's partly about the games industry. Uh, I think, uh, text adventures are this amazing hybrid. And one of the things that you find when you reach for comparisons is that sometimes you say, this really resembles the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And sometimes you say, this really resembles world of Warcraft. Um, uh, the, the interactivity and the fact that it's based in ambiguous, uh, verbal or linguistic rhetoric that you read and write words, which can be misunderstood, um, means that sometimes looking to, um, a video game and sometimes looking to a novel really helps you to understand what text adventures are. So my dream is that, uh, in somewhat the same way that I discovered Marianne Buckle's dissertation and said, wow, this is so amazing. This is such great work. I, I, um, can't believe someone has done this. This helps me so much. I dream that somebody might pull my dusty dissertation off the shelf in 10 years and that that person might either be in um, research in the video games industry or they might be uh, a poet or a writer who's using uh, interactive computation to create literature. Um, and that either person might say, oh, an interactive fiction approach really makes sense for the video game I'm designing or the poem that I'm writing, because this really helps me understand how computers and language can work together. Okay. Um, now do you have a personal favorite? <clears throat> um, I'd have to say Emily Short is by far my, my favorite contemporary writer. Um, her work is amazing. Uh, it's so hard when you look back and ask yourself what your favorite pieces of writing are. There are two answers. <laughs> One answer is the work that you respect most and think is most important. <laughs> and the other answer is the work that feels like your grandmother's kitchen. <laughs> And uh, Wishbringer for me is the work that I first lived in as a child that felt like reading interactive fiction. That was what interactive fiction felt like because uh, that's where I did interactive fiction first in a way that was really engaging. Um, whereas uh, Trinity, um, I would never attempt to argue to anyone that that Wishbringer was uh, more important or more worthy of their time than Trinity, uh, because I respect her Trinity a great deal. So uh, it's a strange situation. Deal. So uh, it's a strange situation as a as somebody who's planning on teaching a lot of interactive fiction in classes. What works am I going to teach? Well, uh, I'll be teaching to college students. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, if I was giving interactive fiction to my children, uh, I might be forced to go back to the ones that I have the warmest feelings for. And, 
And uh, Sea Stalker was on my list because I knew it. I remembered it as a child. It was like um, because uh, you pilot a sub at one point and you don't want to crash. Um, and I remembered uh, the anxiety and how quickly I would type to make sure that I had steered in the next direction so that my submarine didn't crash into a wall. So I went back to just get a screenshot and just confirm what exactly that looked like and found that was nowhere in the work. <laughs> I had completely imagined it um, because that's how it felt playing it at the time. I felt this incredible time pressure. Um, uh, today I think of IF as contemplative and uh, being all about giving the interactor unlimited time to consider exactly what their next move was. But when I was first playing, it was enough to be told that something was about to happen to make me type quickly in response, which is interesting. The, um... uh, the, the sort of Infocom salon culture of all, all these, these writers together, um, uh, I am fascinated by the history. I'm hoping, actually, this is, I'm looking forward to finding out more about it. Partly because um, you get the feeling that some of these uh, people who were doing interactive writing really had um, access to what I guess Virginia Woolf would call a room of one's own. Uh, they, they had they had a little a little space, a little money, and a little time to sit there and just think about it and do it right. Um, but actually, their situation wasn't greatly different from a lot of the revolutionary uh, contemporary IF people of the last ten years that that um, a lot of people assumed that the difference between corporate IF uh, in the 80s and the independent scene in the 90s was that, well, corporate IF, right? It's like the video game industry. You have a team of 30 people, and then you have some engineers, and then you have a bunch of systems programmers. And then I th there are a couple things I think about that. One is that actually even within the current uh, IF communities, the Usenet groups, the, the, the MUDs, the wikis, and so forth. Um, a large amount of what has been done is documenting recent stuff and the best known Infocom games. There's an enormous amount of corporate era IF that we don't know very much about. And there's a lot of really well-known texts that we haven't talked about very much. So people will say things like, oh, the first one move work, or the first puzzleless work, or uh, these kinds of works are really rare, or switching gender, or switching tense, or time period, we've never seen that before. But then often you can actually go back and find earlier examples. I think in a lot of ways, examples. I think in a lot of ways, the, the real history of corporate IF hasn't been written yet. Um, that's partly that's partly because we haven't quite gotten the British and American and Italian and Spanish and French scenes together yet. Uh, it's partly because um, the Infocom catalog is blessed. You know, it was constantly re-released. It found, uh, in some sense, safe harbor uh, with a corporation, and. So we've had access to it that's been ongoing. A lot of these, um, like The Prisoner, um, it, you know, individual collectors have them, but you have to either pirate the works or else, um, or else exchange rumors about them. Like a lot of software, enormous amounts of it became vaporware or just disappeared. Um, and um, and uh, some people, because they've been so excited about writing IF, um, and because the contemporary languages and tools and possibilities are so compelling, um, uh, they're more interested than writing in writing than reading, and that's that's normal. But that means that uh, um, after working on researching IF for a few years, I kind of stumble upon an extra catalog of say four or five hundred British works, 
that I'd been totally unaware of because nobody in this particular IF community or that particular IF community talked about them. I'm like, oh, these exist? <laughs> um, so we haven't, we haven't quite got there um, uh, to the point where we can even say what the important firsts are yet. Uh, we don't know. We're discovering our own history. Uh, and uh, corporate text adventure games and corporate interactive fiction were not like the film is industry and are not like the games industry. Um, I found a quote once uh, by one of the Infocom developers saying that they would have an author, a programmer, and a few beta testers and do a game in nine months. Um. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, huh? do what you got to do. It's fine. <clears throat> Um, whatever, might, might, um, my, all I was saying is that, um, when you look at the way people are writing IF now, and you look at the way that, um, people wrote IF in the 80s for a corporation, it's like what I was saying about Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own. People are writing IF when they get off work, or they're writing IF while they're at work, if they have a job that enables them to do that. But in essence, uh, we know what this model looks like. It doesn't look like the films industry. It doesn't look like the games industry. It looks like Faulkner at his security job with his typewriter in a little hut. Uh, you know, uh, IF is one to two people and a few beta testers. And if you're getting paid and you get to do it all the time, it's nine months. And if you're not, then it's maybe a lot more, you know, or, or a few years. But um, it looks like writing novels. Um, that's really exciting to me. Uh, because if that's true, and I suspect that's true, that actually that uh, Moretzky and Moriarty we're doing something really similar to what the exciting authors that we see today are doing now. It hasn't changed. Um, if that's true, then there's something really significant about creating text adventure games, that it's not just indie the way indie film is indie. It's a kind of interactive digital simulation writing that's about very small groups of, vision, of people coming up with a kind of coherent vision, like you would see in a novel. It's not like a major motion picture. Um, and that's something that's been true since the beginning. That's something I can get really excited about. Um. Well, to me, the most misunderstood thing about interactive fiction is definitely the idea that there is a player character in interactive fiction and that is someone that you enter and become in the interactive fiction world. I think this is a bad idea. It came from a lot of places. It got started very early on. Um, and it consistently makes interactive fiction experiences either very frustrating or very boring for people who don't instinctively understand how interactive fiction works. Um, most of the interesting characters in interactive fiction to be are people who are not you. Uh, like Perry Sim. Uh, most of the interesting uncharacterized characters are still not you. Uh, the character in Leather Goddesses of Phobos can be male or female, but is a remarkably consistent person and has certain things that that person will or won't do and certain things that person is or inter isn't interested in. Um, if, you, if you try to believe that like an avatar in the online virtual world Second Life, 
that you're going to be able to create your own identity and then enter a virtual world in interactive fiction, you're going to be constantly irritated and frustrated by the fact that um, interactive fiction doesn't work that way. You're always inhabiting this sort of other consciousness who thinks certain things are significant and certain things aren't, and who isn't willing to do certain things. Um, um, I remember hearing some people getting incredibly frustrated that they would ask the detective in deadline to uh, take several drinks of whiskey, and after the first drink, the detective will say, uh, or the parser will say, uh, no, no, no more than that, after all, you're on the job. Um, that's a very normal thing in interactive fiction, that the, the work tells you these are the limits. This is what the experience will and won't do. But for a person who thinks of interactive fiction as being a kind of immersive 3D virtual world physics engine um, with uh, objects which can bang into each other in space and energy that can be directed against matter, um, if they think of it in that way, they're going to feel uh, put upon uh, constantly limited, and they'll say, oh, this is a terribly primitive Baroque technology, uh, instead of saying, wow, what a wonderfully sophisticated way of shaping a particular point of view, a particular experience, and a particular set of actions that help me experience not what it's like to be me standing around in this living room, what, what it's like to be this detective participating in this investigation. Um, so that... To me, that's the biggest misunderstanding. Um, so that, to me, that's the biggest misunderstanding in interactive fiction. When people set up IF as being, uh, you participate um, as yourself, uh, as as was often presented in the advertising ma matter, like you enter this adventure. Um, it really confuses people as to what's required of them. Similar to if an improvisational stage group uh, who was calling a member up out of the audience. Um, uh, it's the difference between them saying, uh, we, we need somebody in the audience to come up here and play themselves. And them saying, and now we're going to recruit one of the people in the audience to be the prince. That's a huge distinction. And it's usually the distinction between making what happens in IF work and making it not work. And it also really enables the person who participates in IF um, to understand what it is they're doing and be successful. Okay. Um, I can understand why um, people who are interested in creating character-based or rhetorically impressive experiences, the contemporary writers who want to explore what I have can do, uh, really moved away from mazes because they felt like they were playing second fiddle to the parts of interactivity that the graphics card had already started upstaging them on. Um, uh, typing, go north, go east, go south, go east, go north, go east. Um, at a certain point, you start to long for a joystick, and that's why um, that's why I think conceptual mazes, you know, something where you have to realize that uh, the way out is always the way the wind's blowing. Um, that's something that IF does really well, um, and especially um, what IF does really well in mazes, in my opinion, is. Um, telling you that space is organized the way you think of it. Uh, two, uh, to me, extremely great examples of um, spatial thinking in IF are... Uh, two, uh, to me, extremely great examples of um, spatial thinking in IF are the bathrooms in Leather Goddesses of Pho Phobos. Um, your, your, gen your gender becomes whatever bathroom you go into, right? Um, and so which way you go means something. Um, but the other one, Photopia, uh, when you wander around in Mars, uh, the next significant landmark is always whichever way you go, right? That's, that's how the surface of Mars in Photopia works. So 
uh, unlike, say, a level designer working on Halo 3, who maps out an extensive, realistically based physical geography, uh, the geography of Mars and Photopia is literally well, go whichever direction you go next. Oh, you find this significant artifact in the desert. The geography is the story of each thing that you next stumble onto. Uh, IF has been doing that really well very early on, but I think uh, that's a completely different way of thinking about mazes. Um, so yeah, I tend to, I tend to agree. Um, Old-style mazes in 3D games and console games and in, in IF always will work to burn more hours and create more kind of consumable playtime. But if you're not understanding the way the author is thinking and having insights, what's the point? There was a discussion I had, I think, with Lev. I'm, I'm prejudiced because I'm... I've been spending a lot of time in a literature department. I'm coming at this from a very sort of artsy fartsy, high high culture angle. But I will say that if shorter, more conceptually based IF that's a lot like writing is what IF is really good at, then you can always add elements to IF that make them sell and consume more like games. You know, many console games, you have to get X number of hours of play where it's a no-fly, right? People will, people will write reviews of PC and console video games saying, I beat it in nine hours, I'm so angry, right? Because they paid good money for it and the going market rate right now of all the competing games is that they should be able to get about maybe say a dollar per hour or 50 cents per hour worth of entertainment out of it. So if they purchase it for a certain price and then they, uh, they uh, exhaust it in a certain amount of time, they're upset. This isn't exactly the same way people relate to say a Harry Potter book. <laughs> or, or an, indeed any novel, that for a lot of people, even though print books are commodities, and even though you read them for a certain amount of time and then you're done, a lot of people don't think of them in the way they do of a game as a kind of an experience that you get a certain amount of time-based quality out of it. I think in this way, a lot of contemporary IF, mazeless contemporary IF that tends to orient towards content uh, that's conceptual, um, uh, as currently conceived, it's just not marketable under a games industry idea of what you're buying. Because the games industry idea would always say, you're going to have to add more mazes or you're going to have to add unlockable cards that you find and there are going to have to be 50 of them so that we can layer enough extra stuff on there to keep the interactor busy for an extra 12 hours. Otherwise, they're going to feel cheated when they're done. Um, but that's an entire way of thinking about an experience that's not the way somebody thinks about uh, a Harry Potter novel. They buy it, they read it, they're proud of the fact that they finished it in two and a half hours, then they read it three more times in the next week, and then they post about it to their, to their various groups. Uh, and they think of it as uh, a concept that they can get to know better and better and better and understand more and more and more deeply in a way that for many people, um, and I'm generalizing wildly here, some obviously many games do work this way and some books work vice versa, but many people, once they've uh, defeated the game completely, Great, cast it aside, go get the next go get the next thing. If they beat it in nine hours, they were cheated. Okay. I am good. good. Sure. All right. That's it. Whether you call them text adventure games or whether you call them interactive fiction, there's this assumption that this kind of interactive digital rhetoric that describes an experience is not fact 
why interactive fiction? Why not interactive nonfiction? Uh, can you enter something that looks like an interactive fiction, but is strictly a description of a historical event or experience um, or scene? We have a lot of interactive historical fiction, you know, that's based on historically real places. Uh, we have some things that are uh, interactive depictions of historically real events. Uh, 1981 uh, is about um, uh, the Hinckley assassination attempt. Um, 1983 and uh, Lost New York are both uh, just totally full of historical documentation, but they're still historical fiction. Uh, in a way that we're really familiar with reading historical fiction novels. But there are other genres of writing. There is nonfiction. And something I've been thinking about, and I don't know the answer to, is can you do nonfiction in this format? And if you can, what would that look like and what would that mean? I'm not sure if this is a situation where the terms that we use and the way we think of what these things were evolving out of something that kickstarted the computer games industry has limited us to not doing nonfiction. Or if it's just that the very act of allowing an interactive person to come and enter a world means that it has to be fiction because otherwise there could only be one way. I'm not certain. I think it's a really complicated issue, but that there are a lot of possibilities in other kinds of rhetoric that we haven't even begun to explore with, uh, don't call it interactive fiction, call it command line literature. Okay. We'll go with that. Oh, um, I guess, <laughs> are you happy with your choice of a subject for your dissertation? Uh, I'm delighted. Uh, I think you go through stages in any long project where you love it, you hate it, you wish you'd never done it. Um, but I'm really lucky that I got through to the end and felt like I'd both made a contribution and spent my time on something that really mattered. Um, I don't know because I'm at this moment that literally the very moment where it has been, uh, turned in, and I'm waiting to see what happens next. I don't know if um, my fate will be to be left in uh, some sort of academic dustbin of history, or if uh, this will be a brilliant coup that will become the cornerstone of a, of a luminous career. But I do know that it was time well spent, and that when I look at what I've done, I think even if not me, I hope somebody comes along and builds on this. There's so much we haven't explored. There's so many questions we haven't answered. And there are so many things people haven't tried to do. If I couldn't be a person who was, among other things, studying interactive fiction uh, in a critical scholarly classroom, I would love to be a creative writing teacher who was teaching interactive fiction writing because uh, I think a lot of interactive fiction uh, that would be incredibly exciting to study hasn't even been written yet. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, I mean, I was I was born in 1977, so uh, sort of um, I kind of experienced everything secondhand, but early. I was <clears throat> probably five to seven years old and saw, um, uh, I think it was an, an edition of uh, Microsoft Adventure, which was this uh, gray box. Um, it came in a manual that was um, uh, boxed in a rigid cardboard uh, book like you would get for a, um, like you'd get for an encyclopedia edition. Uh, it was the exact same box that the Microsoft Basic came in. Um, and so they had uh, technical manuals, programming manuals, and this copy of Adventure. Uh, and I think that was the first one that I actually 
um, played. Like I said, I think I was about five to seven years old, but I haven't really gone back and tried to reconstruct uh, my personal history with it. But um, where and so the first thing that I ever wanted to do when I wanted to learn, um, I think it was PC Basic, was I wanted to write text adventure games with PC Basic. So I went very quickly from, oh look, it's it's Zork, it's Wishbringer, to how do I use go to and go sub commands to create. Uh, two rooms and an object that you can pick up. Um, that was, um, yeah, trying to write something that approximated Infocom's technology using PC Basic uh, was um, was doomed to failure. But I, but that impulse saying um, I want to, I don't want to just play this. I want to write this. I'm. Uh, it's very exciting to me. Like I, I, part of the reason I wanted to study interactive fiction was because I do see it as a writable medium. I fell in love with the community partly because they were a writing community, not just a reading community. Um, and, uh, and I don't really see bad writing as being a big problem. I think you get enormous amounts of bad writing in every, every medium in poetry and, and, and fiction and nonfiction and, uh, bad interactive fiction is, you know, no worse than any other kind of bad writing, but you do get some good. So, with um... uh, a lot of things in retrospect about my particular personal relationship to IF have everything to do with being born almost exactly the same time IF was born. If I had been born uh, three years earlier, I might have had an entirely different experience. Um, uh, or three years later for that matter. But as it was, all of these, um, uh, all of these moments in IF, uh, connected to what age I was at the time. The, the world will never know the IF that I wrote as a child. That, that is, I have personally consigned them to the dustbin of history. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that I haven't, um, uh, backed up the five and a quarter inch floppies, <laughs> um, to, uh, to DVD, but it does mean that, uh, I have no intention of that ever entering the public record. Um, I, I, I think <clears throat> I have, um, I, I, I think <clears throat> I have wiki and Baff's guide and all of these catalogs They're they're totally invaluable. And, uh, in some ways they're, uh, they aim to be comprehensive, you know, kind of record every, every single IF that was ever written. But at a certain moment when we start to imagine that IF could become more like writing, there are kinds of writing that are just insignificant and don't need to be in the public library. Uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, I have a few friends that at the time uh, were also writing things. We, we traded floppies back and forth together and played our are, are terrible creations, but, uh, I, I won't be submitting any of theirs to, uh, IF wiki any more than mine. It's just, it's better to just let it lie. <laughs> are there, um, are there, um, my first impulse is always to say, uh, let's imagine, let's imagine this as a kind of writing. And so then the question uh, at what age should people write IF might be a lot like the question, well, at what age should people write? Uh, let them, let them write badly as early as possible and let them write more and better later. Um, uh, and I think in some ways that's, that's a good idea for almost any activity that you imagine as being important and accessible. But in other ways, I suspect that there are some things about IF that um, because it's relational and interactive, uh, it's actually based in a sort of advanced rhetoric that very young children will inherently not understand. I was reading something about Lacan's mirror stage recently and this idea of the child uh, encountering the image of themselves in a mirror. Uh, there are a lot of um, cognitive development uh, 
about stages of development. Some, some, <clears throat> there are a lot of things people say about stages of development and what moments at which something will be significant to a child or a child will understand something. Like when the game of peekaboo suddenly stops to be amazing because you know that the mother is still there behind the, behind the cloth. And I think in some ways IF incorporates some things like that having to do with the way the protagonist of the game and the person playing are separate entities in relation to something unknown. In order to make unknown, in order to make IF that's really interesting, the author needs to be able to imagine themselves as not themselves. And that's not always a basic requirement of writing, but I do think it is a more basic requirement of IF. That's what makes IF rhetoric work, is having a really good understanding of the difference between what you don't know yet and what you're about to find out. Um, I also think